So I'm going to be uh, incredibly brief because I know that Peter has a hard stop and then we can all be verbose and uh, and talk and have questions and comments. Uh, oh my God, I see Keith's face. <laughs> so uh, Peter, take it away. Thanks, Harold. No, so, so um, uh, like, like Harold said, I, I'm afraid I have a hard stop in half an hour. So today I'm here basically to kind of talk to you about uh, AI and data and data governance. So with a focus on the AI side of things, but we'll also talk, talk about data governance, which is also part of the title. Um, and so it's to kind of present to you what, what can be done in that respect. What are the trends that we're seeing right now from our clients, the kind of work that, that we're led to do also for, for clients in that sector. And so, so that hopefully this can be useful and uh, perhaps even inspiring or, uh, or, or basically a, a source of, uh, basically a source of sharing of knowledge basically among our, among this network uh, so i am quickly going to find the screen that i'm sharing and this should now work so we have basically a, a few slides on the kind of stuff that we have been led to do for clients and uh, i'm hoping that afterwards this will trigger discussion among everyone else who's present about the kind of work that they've been doing as well and if uh, at one point you are faced with any questions, you know that uh, some of us have also faced similar ones. So hopefully this can be useful. Now, I want to start with a focus on AI governance because the focus here is really AI. But we'll be talking about data governance as well, simply because very often data governance is actually used as a means of also supporting AI initiatives. And, and it's actually often the basis for lots of AI systems. It's having a proper sit, a proper way of managing data in place within organizations. So if we look first at the notion of AI, well, first we have to look at the uh, how this concept is perceived. And I very I often like to use the OECD definition as an example of something that's basically commonly accepted, it's got a certain authority, and a lot of organizations seem value in this definition, but it's a bit of a heavy one, and so I put it at the, at the bottom of the slide, but we've got a kind of simplified, summarized version that we use that you see above, and so the idea is an AI system, it's a machine-based system that's going to analyze input, basically input and data that comes from humans or machines, and then it's basically going to lead to some kind of output. Now, the nature of that output is going to define whether you see this as generative AI or discriminative or predictive AI. And so there's been obviously a lot of talk recently about generative AI, but uh, predictive and discriminative AI is something that's been around for a long time, very widespread use. And that is the kind of AI that most organizations use. What, what it has been new is suddenly the, the influx in interest, the sudden increase in interest in generative AI uh, solutions. But that's actually also fueling a greater interest also in other uh, predictive AI solutions. And so the typical, typical difference between the two is generative AI is going to generate content. You know, it's chat GBT is the example. Uh, so you're generating uh, images, you're generating text, you're generating uh, music nowadays, you're generating all sorts of things, basically content that's being done based on instructions that you give. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is then predictive AI, where I'm basically going to generate some recommendations. And so, for instance, the typical example uh, on uh, some e-commerce weapon platforms such as Amazon, the recommendations of other products that might be of interest, but it's not someone who's randomly coding that in saying you might be of in you might be interested in this. This is all generated algorithmically by basically based on behavior patterns uh, of user consumption and so on. So what then is AI governance? Well, in practice, AI governance is a series of policies and processes, as well as technical requirements in order to, to basically facilitate a certain view, a certain use of AI systems. And most organizations nowadays are focusing on responsible use of AI system. And so the AI, AI governance projects that we've been working on, it's always been that focus. It's been about how can we as an organization 
help our users, our employees, etc., understand what they can do, what they cannot, and how they should be using basically AI systems. And there's always this underlying aim that is we want to limit our own exposure. So organizations across the world have been faced with, for instance, this sudden uh, increase in number of people who are basically saying, I want to use uh, GPT-4 to support my work. I want to use some kind of tool because, you know, we're all lazy people. Everyone always wants some a tool to do the work for them. So basically, I want to use ChatGPT to do my work for me. Well, there are limits to what can be done and what is authorized. And there are risks associated with just allowing, just giving a green light to allow free reign. So there's an angle of limiting risk and liability. There's also a positive aspect, namely encouraging the proper use of AI systems. Very often, there's also another, another dimension that you should never forget is that a lot of companies want to be able to use the fact that they're using AI as a marketing tool. They want to be able to sell that idea to their customers that we're better because we have a more appropriate tool that, that helps us to get that. Now, companies always have to be a bit careful with that because the more they focus on the tools, well, the easier it is for someone else to say, okay, well, if I can bypass you, I just need the tool. And so, so you have to always be careful when you are helping clients with issues regarding AI governance, that basically they are mindful of the fact that they shouldn't be too transparent either. And so what does this lead to? How does an AI governance framework typically look? Well, in, in the work that we've been doing for clients, we've, we've helped organizations put in place AI governance frameworks. And very often it takes the form of a few different things. There's training, obviously, um, because we help basically in help organizations and to teach their employees what to do. But there are a few building blocks that we see very commonly and that, that are very useful, I think, in terms of identifying what are the different priorities and the different stakeholders who have different, different things that they can draw from an AI governance framework. First, and so I, I, I would like to, to basically divide this into three categories of users. You have those who are basically more procurement type. And so that's often the very first step. You know, it's, we're going to get an external AI solution. Okay, what do you look for? There are a number of contractual reflexes that an organization should have in order to limit its risks. And so they basically often we help to build a playbook, a kind of do's and don'ts from a contractual perspective. And so these are standard clauses, these are fallbacks, so that then an organization can manage what it's doing in terms of negotiation, uh, what it's doing from a contractual perspective to limit its risks, and also to ensure that it has sufficient information about the systems that it, it is buying. We'll touch upon some of the do's and don'ts in a, in a few minutes. Another point then is when uh, you are developing uh, an AI system or training an existing one, basically with own data. And so there, it's really useful to give clients do's and don'ts, things that they can understand, that they can use, that the development teams can follow. These do's and don'ts uh, is something where typically the lawyers themselves are not the best place to understand the very specific requirements but you do need to have a dialogue with the technical teams to understand what are the priorities, what are internal processes that they already use, and how can you combine all of that into a nice package that makes sense. And then you have the users of the AI systems. So you have the buyer, you have the developer, and you have the user. And the user of an AI system also has a number of key principles that he or she needs to comply with. And these are critical to ensure that uh, there's no, no that there are not too many risks being generated by the use of the AI system, but it's also a nice way to basically promote the fact that the AI systems can be used. So let's now take a look at that from the reverse order. And so we're going to start by looking at the perspective of the users. Now, very often in these AI you know, governance situations, what we have found is that the principles, the underlying principles are similar. Because ultimately, every company wants the same thing. They want to ensure that they are not 
creating any risks from a data protection perspective and from a confidentiality perspective. They want to ensure that people are not using the AI system to basically bypass human review and basically just letting the AI do its job without actually checking what's being done. They want to ensure that if anything is being generated on which the company wants to have certain kinds of rights or control, that there is addition that there are additional steps being taken, um, and also that content uh, or other output is not being used that could create risks in terms of liability. Uh, they want to ensure transparency and obviously non-discrimination. So let's take a small look at some of those. The first one, protect privacy and confidentiality. Well, in practice, there, there are two dimensions to this because users have to be educated to ensure that they do not say, for instance, in uh, that they don't just open uh, Bing and say, here's the code of uh, a piece of software that I've been working on. Can you improve it? Can you add this functionality or whatever? Because the code itself would then be used for, for to basically further improve the model. And so there's this, in, there's this aspect of feedback that you are submitting input that then will be used to train the machine further. And so there's a confidentiality aspect that can be critical for organizations. We've had sufficient examples, like notably Samsung, um, where organizations did not put in place proper guidance in advance, and then people misuse that. And then, unfortunately, your proprietary piece of code or of or your, your uh, data set that has been analyzed could basically then be recreated by someone else using a prompt. So there are aspects there that are very important. Um, verifying output is something that is really critical, but it depends on the level of risk associated with the content being generated. So there, very often, what we found is that it's useful to give clients not only the principles themselves, but also some kind of risk matrix or, uh, or guidance. And so, for instance, here's an example of a, um, of a kind of, uh, decision tree that we help to make for clients to help them to understand scenarios where users can use, for instance, chat GPT or something similar without requiring internal approval. And then other scenarios where they needed to take additional steps. And so here you see the, the illustration that you start by saying, well, are you using it purely for inspiration? If so, then your risk is more limited anyway. And then the second question then is, are you then using any confidential information or personal data as input? If the answer is no, well then your risk is very limited. And so uh, in practice, this client basically said, in that case, I don't mind people using it without any additional steps. And so you can basically ensure that there's a decision tree that is that takes into account the risk appetite of the organization in order to make it work, in order to help people use these tools, the aim is not to prohibit their use, but to ensure that there's a framework surrounding it. Now, just another word about transparency. Um, there are two components to transparency because obviously those of us who also work on data protection think often, well, it's transparency from the perspective of tell people that their personal data might be processed in that context. But there's a very important other component to transparency, that is be transparent about your use of an AI system. And this is because if I am going to use an AI system to, for instance, generate content for me or to create, to create a set of recommendations or predictions, if I then go on and sell that to a client or I then basically just pass that along to my superior, I'm basically attributing myself authorship of the work in question. And that creates risks. First, there's the ethical dimension that is really important that we should never forget. These AI governance systems and frameworks aren't just there from a legal perspective. They're also to encourage the ethical use of AI systems. And so I shouldn't present myself as the author of something that I didn't author. And so this is relevant notably in the context of, uh, of employee evaluations and making sure that people get 
rewarded for the work that they have actually done. And so there are, there are certain rules to put in place regarding when someone is able to say, I created this, when in fact uh, an AI did the job for them. So transparency is critical, not only from the perspective of what data I'm inputting, but also how I'm using the output. There are cases where that isn't necessary. And so this depends on the reflexes of the client. For instance, well, I have one client where they said, well, we don't actually mind that people use AI tools to generate content as long as it's not something that's then going to be used externally. And so if it's purely used internally, no need to be, uh, no need to basically put too many guardrails along the way, but don't present it as a work of your own. So there was a transparency component to that that was really important. If we then move on to the contractual side of things, so let's look at the procurement aspect. There you have slightly different uh, aspects that come into play. Now, the basic principles remain the same. You'll see confidentiality remains relevant, protection of rights, and there there's also an IP component to it. Uh, human autonomy is one that becomes very relevant here because it's about ensuring that there are guardrails in place within the external solution to ensure that it's not being misused, that it's not being used to take decisions without human verification, which obviously for those uh, working on the data protection side of things also is relevant from the perspective of automated decision making. Um, but it's relevant notably for non-discrimination purposes as well. The feedback loop is one thing that often is overlooked at the level of the contract itself, um, because it's something, it's a more technical component that people forget when negotiating a contract. It's trying to make sure that there are certain guardrails in place against the reuse of output as input. Why is this relevant? Because AI systems themselves can be heavily influenced by the output that they generate. If you keep on reusing it, then at one point it's going to basically increase bias because it keeps on getting the same kind of output as input. And so it's reinforcing its own bias, reinforcing the, the, the way it perceives certain things. So you have to be very careful about the feedback loop. And that's something that where you can have contractual clauses in place also in that respect. And so here are a few examples of do's and don'ts that we have included in uh, contractual playbooks in the past. And so it's notably things like uh, uh, seek mandatory disclosures uh, regarding transparency so that within the tool itself, there is some level of transparency. Uh, note that this is, this is a recommendation that is generated for you uh, or that is generated by an AI tool. Um, things about evidence of measures against bias. So when we had the example uh, ages ago when uh, Google Images started to have uh, some kind of classification or labels that were generated automatically. We had the example of um, of certain uh, gor uh, gorillas being basically put alongside people of uh, uh, people who are black skinned and seen being considered to be similar. This was an obvious case of bad bias, really awful selection of the training data that then basically generated completely wrong labeling. And this is a kind of thing where providers can be required to provide evidence of the fact that they have taken measures to fight against bias. And it's something interesting that I've seen over the past few, few months is that more and more clients are then starting to ask this, ask this evidence from providers. Providers aren't yet fully ready to provide this information, so it's uh, often a bit of a fight but they are starting to see that there's a demand from clients for this. So there are a number of do's and don'ts. This is a selection, but there are a number of do's and don'ts that you can build into these playbooks. And then you can have example clauses and then fallbacks if the, for instance, the external service provider pushes back against it, or if you're working for a provider, uh, what if the customer demands for more, you can always have different fallbacks. Then you have the developer side of things. So when you are developing or training a tool, there are other do's and don'ts that can be relevant. And it's we found that it's really useful for the development teams to have some guidance because very often they're approaching us from a very practical perspective and not necessarily mindful of all the legal implications 
of the use of the tool. And so we found that it's useful there to have do's and don'ts regarding the design itself of the tool, how training data uh, is selected and how input is managed, and also regarding user-facing instructions. And so an example of a relevant one for the training data is, you know, the, there's a nice don't in the middle here. Don't use any proprietary or confidential information as input unless this use has been approved. And there are easy ways for the developers or those in charge of internal selection of data to basically put this in place so that they are disclaimers in place for users when they are using a tool. And so then you build security and confidentiality into the product by making sure that there are warnings that appear above the input uh, field or above any form that is being used as, as source of data. And so that, that's a nice way of making this practical for the users as well. The, at the top, you also see uh, don't, use, uh, don't use an AI system that is a black box without sufficient guarantees that it meets all the company's requirements. This is an example of something really important that a lot of AI tools are black boxes today. And so there's a lot of effort being done by clients to try to get some information, some guarantees that there are strict, there are strict confidentiality measures in place at the level of how they initially trained uh, a tool that basically they also took measures to ensure the lawfulness of the data being collected and used to train the algorithms themselves. And so there's a lot of things that you can do from a contractual perspective, but also at the level of developers themselves, the developers can make a number of selections and choices that can be really important. That's very briefly uh, an overview of what's going on from an AI governance perspective. And then I have a few more, more minutes just to talk a, a tiny bit about data governance, because like I said, very often data governance projects serve as a basis for AI governance uh, framework discussions, because what is data governance is really about how I, what processes I have in place to manage the vast amount of data that I have within my organization. And so uh, we have faced, we have seen a lot of typical uh, complaints that uh, uh, or typical uh, objections that uh, uh, that clients were raising. Well, it's not it's not relevant for us. And in practice, you see that every single complaint that is very common has an easy answer to it. And you as, as lawyers can also contribute to making clients or understand the importance of having a data governance framework in place. And typically what do we see? Well, we see that one aspect of data governance and that then becomes extremely relevant when it comes to data analysis and so AI systems is having some kind of decent data classification approach in place. The issue with data classification is that if you go into too much detail, then there's a nice work that's being done at the beginning to try to classify all sorts of information that I have in my systems, and then people abandon it. They do not maintain it simply because it's too difficult to maintain. And so we found that in practice, it's really important to have a limited number of levels, top levels of the classification in order to make data governance workable. And so that then allows you to ensure that there are certain levels of security measures, certain restrictions in terms of access that are put in place, ideally at a system level, and if needed at a data item level, and that then facilitates the work later on. A few more things to mention in that respect. Well, this is an example of how this works in practice, that uh, where there are tables of data then you can have a system-wide approach to the, the data. You can basically classify the data at the top level by saying these are the kinds of data that are, that are basically public. These are those that are strictly confidential. And so on, you have a structured approach with loose documents digitally or in pa on paper. It's really very difficult to put that in place. And so instead of that, the focus that we've seen clients try to do is try to emphasize the moment of creation of that data item. So for instance, having a, a plugin in Word that basically allows you to just select among four uh, levels of confidentiality, 
And that then helps to maintain the data classification going forward. Now, it's really important to emphasize that lawyers can and should be involved in this. And so all of you have a role to play as well there. That you can basically show that there's, if you think about the broader vision, the fact that data governance is about taking value out of data, and then that value can then basically translate into the use in the context of an AI system. And so you can try to basically show that having a lawyer involved throughout the process helps ensure that all of the re necessary requirements are observed, are taken into account at every stage of the broader project. And so externals can be involved, but you do want to ensure that there's a dialogue with a number of other stakeholders internally so that the broader the broader impetus for getting value out of the data can be found. And so what does that translate to in terms of output, the kind of output of a data governance project? Well, you have policies that this uh, can lead to, like a data classification policy, uh, the identification of who has different roles within an organization. Uh, we've basically helped organizations put uh, questionnaires in place to help with data stewards, a specific part of the chain, to understand how they could manage requests for data. And these aspects are then critical when it comes to the selection of training data for AI systems, because if you do not have sufficient guardrails in place in terms of identifying who should have access to data, who controls that data, and then how that data can be used, then you know that it's going to be a wild west when someone tries to put in place an AI solution because there will be no one to control how what, what kind of, of data is being used and what is the level of quality of that data. So it shows that data governance is a really important, it, it's basically a really important foundation on which to build an AI governance project. And so as closing remarks, something that I always tell clients is, that they should start small, but be very ambitious about what they're doing regarding data governance and later on regarding AI governance, because there's a lot, a lot that they can find in the data that they have. They just have to think, to look, and to basically to structure their approach. And then they can let an AI loose on it and say, we want to draw this from it. We want to uh, identify their insights from this perspective but without knowing the data that is underneath it, they won't be able to get good value out of it. And so it's really important to get as many levels as possible involved so that the, the projects themselves can be a success and that they are maintained going forward, that there's some kind of incentive to continue feeding the machines themselves, to continue ensuring that the data is classified as it should be, and that helps clients to ensure that the entire approach to data and AI is a success. And with that, I have finished my half hour of a speedy overview. Um, I'm afraid I won't be able to stay here for questions, uh, but Harold, um, please do uh, manage the, the rest of the session without me. Uh, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you might have as well afterwards. Please send me an email. Uh, you have it here on the slide, or you have it also in the uh, in the invitation. There was a reference to the link to our pro my profile uh, online. I hope this has been useful and interesting. And then I'm afraid I have to leave you. So enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you, Peter. And uh, good luck in your next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. So that was fantastic. Um, I don't know, Meryl, if you don't mind if I just uh, spin it from here. Yeah, keep going. Your, your, your face is uh, Keith's face, which is a little bit of <laughs> I memory. know. That was so um, I could open the meeting, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, uh, Peter's presentation was a pretty amazing overview of the uh, one of the sections of the um, issues, the AI 
legal issues that I'd set out in the agenda for the group in general uh, that I'd like to talk about a little bit more uh, in this first inaugural session. Um, and I also want to open it up for questions and thoughts and comments for people in general. And then we can kind of spin it into a conversation if uh, that's what everyone is interested in doing. Um, but first, I'd like to to just sort of set the tone of what we are not, what we are talking about and what we're not talking about. Um, this group is to discuss AI legal issues and to develop the connections and the expertise among us so that we can answer the questions from our clients. Um, well, we're not we're not here to talk about whether AI is going to replace lawyers, um, because obviously it will. <laughs> but not not today. And and when that happens, it's not going to be a legal issue. Uh, it's going to be a, a different kind of question. And uh, if you're interested in the political problems with AI, then uh, um, maybe uh, we can set up a second uh, group to talk about that as well. Um, and we're not here to talk about the mistakes that AI makes. Um, everyone has stories about putting in queries into GPT and coming back with something silly. Um, I think we need to make a mental shift from evaluating whether or not this is going to be a useful tool. Um, and we need to stop thinking about these things as um, powerful calculators and start thinking about them as a, an entirely different um, an entirely different thing uh, and start figuring out what they are. My, my model for working with an AI is uh, uh, as it, an intern, uh, but I don't really have a good feeling for whether this is uh, something that's going to stick going forward. Um, so I'm going to see if I can, I guess I, I'm going to refer to the, to the, uh, seven legal issues that are in the, uh, the notice that Meryl sent out about this meeting. Um, and I'm going to just read them out and then I'm going to ask for anyone who has comments or questions to frame them maybe in these terms, and then we can move forward from there. So the first thing to talk about is the business case for AI products. And I think Peter was alluding to this the entire time. This is all about the clients. Uh, and if, if the things we're talking about don't go back to the business case, then they're not, uh, they're not useful. The second one is the, the special cases for commercial terms. Um, and that's usage, uh, usage and licensing, termination clauses, IPR, copyright liabilities. Uh, Peter mentioned a few other ones that were really interesting. The third one is... Uh, uh, AI evaluated performance met metrics, uh, test benchmarks and performances for hallucinations. Uh, and I found, yeah, Peter also touched on that very briefly, but uh, the the comment about um, that he made about uh, making sure that there's some sort of clause that the the performance of the of the systems is meeting your your company's needs is a really interesting question because how can you guarantee that with something like GPT-4 or generative models? Um, in a certain sense, I think a lot of what he was talking about was is, is all based on the, the old style of models and we need to sort of think uh, to another level. And actually he provided some pretty good answers about using data governance as a substitute for evaluative uh, metrics and for uh, accountability of the systems. Um, the fourth one, D, is the AI-specific regulations. We need to know more about the, the EU AI Act. We need to know more about the other laws that are being passed around the world. Um, e is the AI data governance, which Peter uh, elaborated on very well. Uh, F is the AI product copyrights. Um, who owns the, the, the outputs? Uh, how, how much of the copyright in the input is going to be an issue? And G is the AI decision accountability. The risks of harmful content, the risks related to model bias as individual or societal, and uh, the model transparency, the black boxes, justifications, explainability, interpretability. Can that be done? How would it? How is it measured? What are the do's and don'ts? So um, my questions for the group are, are these comprehensive? Uh, is anything missing? Is there anything we need to add as we go forward? Um, do each of these issues make sense to you, or should we elaborate on any of them? Is anything uh, not quite clear? Um, and then after that, are there any comments and questions that anyone has? The floor is open. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, uh, from my standpoint, I think it's very comprehensive, all these the, the items that you have uh, gathered here, uh, Harold. Congratulations for that. I think you have, well, 
at least from my my standpoint and uh, and and certainly each of one of them can give room to uh, just one uh, discussion about that like uh, the special case commercial terms can give rise to uh, a great discussion and one session just for that <laughs> Uh, Lars, I, I know you, but maybe we should introduce ourselves to everyone uh, now that we're meeting for the first time. Okay, sorry about that. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Laercio Souza. Uh, I'm the, the partner, partner in charge of data protection and uh, IP practice here at Veloz Advogados. We are a medium-sized uh, Brazilian law firm. Uh, here in Brazil, based in São Paulo city. And uh, well, I have the pleasure also to have uh, my partner here. I see Leandro Borges. Uh, Leandro, could you please, if you? Yeah, you have to com you have to complete your in your introduction that you became our CTO recently. I is so involved with all the IT matters here at the firm that is practically our CTO nowadays. I'm Leandro. I'm also from Veloza, from Brazil. Uh, I'm lead the practice, the banking practice here at the firm, and we work together with liars in many issues here with uh, AI, especially for financial institutions and fintechs. Uh, go on, liars. I, I do have a question after you. <laughs> Please go, go on. Uh, Hera was mentioned here. These seven issues. Uh, um, my question is like regarding ethical matters. You think this is on this seventeenth issue, or is this a different one? Like, I mean, when some lawyers prepare a work, you or any employee using chat, for instance, AI, uh, and they present this as their own, especially in the legal market. Like, how we do this with clients? Like, the, what are the ethical issues we can face here, especially for instance? with the bar associations all, all over the world. I can just respond with my thoughts. It's um, This always seems a little strange to me because how many times has, uh, has a lawyer passed off uh, an intern's work as their own without any consequence? Um, when there's a supervisory hierarchy within a firm, uh, at the person at the top of the hierarchy is the one responsible. So as long as the as long as the supervising lawyer is supervising the, the work, um, it doesn't bother me entirely. I'm sure that some bar associations are going to weigh in and we're going to have to talk about that at some point. So the question is, does it fit under uh, any of these issues and do we need to add another issue? Um, mm. Mm, I don't know. I think... Can you can you repeat the, the 71? You mentioned seven. The, the last one I, I didn't get completely. A, the seventh one is the AI decision accountability. So that's the accountability for the decisions of the uh, of the systems. And so, in a certain sense, I think you're you're correct in in uh, putting your example under that issue. Uh, so that if if the AI, if the AI generates some um, legal content that a, that a lawyer then looks at and approves, I think the lawyer is responsible for it. It's, it would be interesting if the AI was generating content that the lawyer wasn't capable of understanding, and then the lawyer passed it on. Um, that's a little strange in a legal context, but you could imagine that in an engineering or a medical context. If, a, if an AI generates a diagnosis and a doctor passes it on and says, maybe you should uh, you know, get some harmful treatment, uh, like a chemo for cancer, um, that might be a problem. Um, I think lawyers are going to have to deal with that later than doctors, but... Yeah, we should think about that. Uh, I would just add a comment that uh, regarding the ethical side, I think this is this is one of the the, the ethical standards. It's, it's something that will. Uh, uh, apply to to all, all all the issues here. This is something that uh, AI brings uh, under discussions is the the ethical usage of it. I think Lucia Lucia Fernandez 
raise the hand. Go on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's morning in Mexico, at least. Um, I'm Lucia Fernandez. I'm from Gonzalez Calvillo in Mexico. I'm the head of the privacy um, practice in the firm, and I'm, I'm co uh, head in the IT practice of the firm. So we've been reviewing these issues like hiring um, a, a AI tools for clients. Uh, we're doing this more on the client side. And I think that list is comprehensive from what I've seen, the biggest concerns of the clients right now, at least the ones uh, my clients have been copyrights. And that's a big issue in Mexico uh, because if you don't agree otherwise, every the work product will be of the AI tool, uh, whoever is giving you the AI tool. Uh, privacy, um, discrimination, it has been a very big, big issue with all the clients. And um, I think those are the biggest concerns. So I think those are included in the in the list that we have right now. But I, I do, I think it's very, at least in Mexico, it's very focused on those three issues, privacy, um, discrimination and copyrights. Can I ask to clarify, did you say that if you don't agree, the work product of an AI is belongs to the AI company? Yeah. Wow. So whomever is giving you the tool would be uh, the the one, it would be a derivative work. What you need to agree, it's a, it's a work for hire. That would be the word in Mexico. And there's a figure in Mexico that's that's considered uh, for, for exactly for that, not, not in the AI context because it's a very old law, but you do need to agree that it will be a work for hire. And otherwise it's a derivative work and it's, and it's of the AI tool. Else. I'll start picking on people if nobody has any questions or comments. I saw a hand go up, but my screen got rearranged. Who just put a hand up? Samuel. Oh, Samuel. Um, hello, good morning. It's also morning here in Caracas, Venezuela. And nice to meet you all. And thank you again for arranging this a uh, Zoom call. Um, actually, it was uh, uh, just a thought that I wanted to share with you is that particularly now in Venezuela, a uh, challenging situation has been for us um, law firms that have been uh, in contact between ourselves as to how we handle um, the use of AI systems because what's happening here, and that's the biggest fear of, I would say, the user population in Venezuela is that, for example, regarding the privacy matters and confidentiality and the data protection regulations, which was addressed in Venezuela, for example, as of this date, we have no data protection or privacy act or regulation at all. Um, the only thing we have is a ruling by the Supreme Court in which they sort of copy pasted um, eight principles that at the time were the inspiration or served or were um, adopted and incorporated to the general rules of the European Union. So that one thing that has been interesting here is how do we address um, to users their concern regarding AI systems when we don't even have a clear regulatory um, standards for um, data protection, which is the biggest concern. So the experience here, and, and I know that is the case of some other countries in other parts of the world, is that we're having to juggle a little bit with general contract rule, contract law and civil liability law to sort of mash up legal solutions and recommendations to clients as to how they can safely address and approach a provider that jumps into a market that's completely unregulated. So um, apparently here, I know this that it's not political, this um, practice group, but it's it's going to be interesting, and I'm, of course, going to keep you all posted on how the government tries to regulate AI, which is something that it wants to do before regulating data protection and privacy matters. So um, it's, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, as, a, as an international group, I mean, it might be an issue for us about certain lack of legal infrastructure in certain jurisdictions. And as an example, the, the AI data governance that Peter talked about um, data governance is pretty meek in Japan. Um, and I can imagine 
that if that's the foundational layer that we need to start with, then uh, there's going to be a lot of work to be done in this jurisdiction. Um, so yeah, maybe we should think about that as a as a an additional issue, putting legal infrastructure in in place in places that doesn't have it. Where does it come from? Where do we get it? And <laughs> the hint we're going to get it from each other probably. So. Any Americans want to tell us what the uh, real story is? You want me to add some stuff, Harold? That'd be great, Spud. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll, I, I'll try to stay within your guidelines, Harold. Um, but I do sit um, and participate in a, a group of Silicon Valley CEOs, about three or 400. And we have uh, meetings or more webinars um, to talk about the use of uh, AI. And uh, I, let me see, I don't want to be too controversial, but um, I, I think 50, everybody knows you, but you should. Uh, so I'll, you should I'll tell you that probably 50% of what Peter said is already outdated. Another 40% will be outdated. Um, and not because of anything he said or did. It's just that that's the nature of what we're dealing with. You should be very nimble. And I'm, I'm passing on information just that is being passed on to um, the CEOs in my group. Um, you should be very, very nimble and understand that um, what you're doing today, probably what you're not going to be doing two or three weeks um, from now, uh, or definitely not six months from now, um, that um, it is a, most of the CEOs believe that uh, AI is a, uh, a point in time and point in business that will change how people uh, work. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pass on some other thing, just kind of general to, because the details of, uh, I know this is focused a lot on governance and things like that, but I think you should probably step back and take a perspective of your client is, because how are your client going to use this? How is it going to be used? You should, you should really understand that because that'll help guide what happens in the future. Um, and, and the reason I say it, you know, the, the obsolescence of it is it's just how, how and this is a, an American word, squishy, um, things are, um, you know, as soon as you try to put pressure in one place, it's going to, some, something's going to squeeze out somewhere else. And that's just the nature of new technologies. Um, you know, the, I mean, like Steve and I know Steve and my partner is on, you know, we grew up here and, um, you know, do you, all of you remember Netscape? I'm sure all of you use Netscape, right? No, you don't because it's gone or pretty much gone. And that's just one example. And same thing with your Motorola Razor. I'm sure you all use that, right? Yeah, well, no one knows. I mean, it just, things move on. And I think you need to, you know, be nimble about it and understand that uh, and be adaptable um, to um, it, uh, to how things are going to change. Now, and anyway, let me just add a couple of things. It's kind of some highlights that I know I'm going to say, because I'm going to speak in, with Harold in Las Vegas in next month, um, CEOs here are being told, or at least are coming to the conclusion, uh, that number one, uh, it is a like I said, it's a very, it, it's a, it's a it's an event in time that is going to be very important, and they need to understand how to use AI. But they're also being told that uh, treat it as an employee, and how to make that employee productive. And this is, again, from a business. And I think you as business people, because you own law firms, should understand that also. Um, and also that it is only going to get you about 80% of the way there. It is not going to replace. So, Harold, I disagree with you. It's not going to replace lawyers at all. Um, in fact, it's not going to replace most people. I should um, be clear. I didn't. I don't mean uh, in our lifetimes. <laughs> not anytime. Not anytime. I mean, that's just not the way they're looking. That, that's not the way the business owners are looking at it or being told to look at it um, because they just don't, you know, anyway, so that, that, that's probably some takeaways that I, I you know, I, I like I said, I, I will try to distill that information, pass it on as best I can, because like I said, we meet every couple of two or three weeks. Um, there, there's one CEO who's our leader who puts on and uh, from, and the last thing I'll say is his, his um, slide deck from, he presented a slide deck and then three weeks later, he did, did it again, the same presentation. The slide deck changed by 
in three weeks. Um, so that's what I, I mean. That's you know, like I said I'm not trying to. I don't know much. Uh, I just know what you know. I'm, what I'm hearing, and this was very instructive to hear. Um, but uh, again, like I'll leave you with: be nimble, be very nimble. So in the in the context of slide decks changing forty percent week to week or month to month, um, I mean, in some sense, how can you be certain that uh, that the AI is not going to replace lawyers? What what is the certainty that is um, the guardrails here? Is it um, like I, I've been seeing a lot of stuff too, but thinking about AI as an employee rather than as a as a piece of software and how to make the employees productive. But uh, do you think that there's a there's a hard ceiling on this one? Um, yeah, I think there is actually, and I, I think that's what most people realize because of the data sets you're dealing with. Um, it would be, it's going to be very, that's what I think they believe that this is also the, the, the data scientists believe that to, to, to curate the data set to a point where you have absolute certainty is near to impossible. Hmm. That that's why they come to that conclusion. We should, uh, we should keep looking at that to, to think about the, the guardrails or not the guardrails, the, the hard ceilings that we might be able to lean on at some point. One of the CEOs, the Silicon Valley CEOs that was part of a discussion runs a company and he's been around for, his company's been around for a while, but I'll just give you this example. Um, and um, so uh, some of you, and again, I don't know what other country, but I know this happens for us here. Let's just say, you know, your, your head hurts and you call your, your doctor, your medical group, and you, you know, you, you, you may be turned over to an AI, AI bot, right? I don't know if you know that in other countries, but that we, that happens here in the United States. And so you start talking or you, maybe you're typing and you're, you know, like a, I'm in my app on my phone for my medical provider, you know, says, well, you know, my head hurts. Well, what part of your head hurts? Or, you know, that starts asking you questions. Right. And um, uh, so he runs a company that is for pet owners. <clears throat> so you call in or you, and you, or you're on the app and the pet, you know, says, well, my dog is throwing up. Well, what is the color of, what the dog is throwing up or it starts prompting you with questions and it tries to get to a place where it is trying to give you some sort of assistance of what's going on with your dog. So you say, cause I said, well, how good is that? Well, if it just goes out to Google, that's pretty much worthless. I mean, when you think about it, right. But, but his curated data set is made up primarily and there's a priority, you know, a primacy is, um, is scholastic articles and, uh, recorded conversations between veterinarians and the, 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 you know, the, the pets owners. And then it goes out to other places. So he's, tr that company is trying to, to uh, curate the data set to give a more accurate answer. But even after all that, you still need to talk to a veterinarian, right? So, I mean, it'll whittle it down and whittle it down and try to get to a place, but just goes to show you that even with, um, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm sure it's just like in your countries, you know, here pets are very, very important to us. And, um, but it still comes down to talking to someone live at the end of the day. And the company understands that. So I, I didn't get you to uh, introduce yourself. Everybody should know that um, Splend is coming from Silicon Valley and has a, a really good vantage point that is really um, a privilege to share. And so, well, so is Steven. So is Steven. Uh, it, well, both of us are real estate lawyers. We, we're not, you know, we, we're not in this field. We're not, we're not part of our IP group. I don't want to be part of our IP group, but <laughs> the milieu in which we find ourselves, um, you know, some of you that have been to other events know, um, you know, I have uh, a son who is a, a data scientist. He works for Samsung. Uh, my daughter-in-law is also a computational biology, biologist who works for a life science company. And I'll tell you, um, here's one more factoid. So who, which, which, you know, we're all concerned about privacy and the amount of data that's out there in the, in the world, right? Who do you think uh, controls a lot of data, the most amount of data that, that of, of our everyday lives? Who do you think? And just some guesses. Apple. Okay. Wrong. Anybody or data, data, data brokers. Any other ideas? Data brokers. No. Alphabet, Google. 
No, that's a good, that's a good, both of those are good guesses, but wrong. It's I Samsung. feel like Merrill doesn't want a data on us. No, yeah, it's probably Merrill, but it's actually <laughs> Samsung. And do you know why it's Samsung? Do any of you own a Samsung well, refrigerator? Bio? No. Another, do, you own a refrigerator by Samsung? How about a toaster? They have appliances, Internet of Things. Think about awesome. it. They touch our lives so much. They have home security systems. They have lighting systems. Amazon hmm. knows absolutely everything I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. TVs. I mean, do you think Samsung isn't doesn't know what you're watching? Before we close off, I want to take a, a question from Lucas, if you're listening, Mr. Lucas, from Poland. And you might have already put it on. Oh, you're there. Yeah, I'm there. Uh, hi. Uh, right. Well, I, I'm I'm really interested in this uh, in this discussion. Uh, uh, I think that uh, all our views from uh, different various jurisdictions are very valuable to somehow grasp the nature of 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 uh, what we are just facing. Uh, I'm I'm rather optimistic about the future in terms of our lawyers' future. Uh, uh, um, I think uh, it's more about grasping AI as a tool for doing uh, our job, doing business. And I think, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm rather a young person, uh, but uh, when I was uh, a trainee, a lawyer, uh, I've uh, spoken with my, uh, my, uh, my uh, yeah, attorney at law, and he said he was uh, uh, he was uh, yeah quite uh, quite old uh, experienced lawyer, and he was experiencing the times when telephones were uh, storming law firms, uh, and which was uh, a huge uh, invention to speed up the work of daily work of a, of a lawyer. Uh, and uh, of course, it's difficult to uh, compare telephone and uh, and AI tools. But uh, uh, this example shows that uh, we we are able to grasp every tool that is uh, facilitating, helping do our daily job. And and I think it will be uh, the same thing with with AI. Uh, I agree that. That uh, every two, three, four weeks we will have some new uh, information, some new developments uh, in terms of AI and how it impacts our our daily work. Uh, but uh, I think at the same time we are still um, uh, uh, in the point of time where this is uh, still something uh, developing. Uh, I think people. Uh, are uh, yeah the, the 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 once once the chat GPT was uh, entering the market uh, around six six months ago it was uh, a clear new thing for everyone now I what I see is that people are steadily getting used to it uh, it is not a, a big news for them uh, and I think they will be. Uh, treating this as a simple tool which is going to stay with us and which is uh, uh, somehow being able to comprehend by uh, everyone uh, doing his job. Uh, I think the same thing will be uh, our part as, as lawyers. So we also get used to it and we'll learn how to use it in a way which will uh, really speed up our job, which will help do our job more properly, more effectively. Uh, to the benefit of our clients and and finally uh, of ours. So that's my take for for the future for for uh, for the coming uh, months, weeks, or years. Thanks. We are at the end of our hour, but um, I see Leandro, you had a question. If you need to drop off, maybe um, thanks for joining us. And uh, we can carry on for a few more minutes to, to wrap up any final thoughts that people have.
Yeah, no, it's just a quick comment on what you said. I agree with Lucas. I'm very optimistic about the future. And I just want to say that I, I kind of disagree with you in the point that uh, AI is going to replace lawyers. Uh, I know you said not in a lifetime, but <laughs> I think one thing that will remain Actually, for lawyers. I said, I said specifically we shouldn't talk about it is what I said. I think like one very important key, uh, key feature for lawyers is a relationship. And I think this is something that AI won't be able to replace. Like, of course, some of the works that we do, like uh, making a contract, uh, they can do this. Uh, but maybe relationships and putting together clients and make the uh, come to a common ground and uh, for contracts, for instance, is something that I think lawyers will still play a very important role, uh, not even not, not only now, but in the future as well. Don't know if someone is talking, um, but to respond to that, it's 100% true. The relationships are the the heart and soul of of being a lawyer. Um, but we can't be complacent. Um, I was um, I was awake the other night um, texting to an AI chatbot, um, and it reminded me of uh, you know high school um, late night phone conversations. It's pretty good. It's it's not there. But uh, at some point, it might be. Uh, and we need to be, like Ms. Blen said, we need to be nimble. And we need to find the, the railings because, you, you know, you play with this stuff enough and you begin to see where it does fall, fall apart a little bit. And there's a question about whether it is going to fall apart on, on that dimension uh, consistently for, for a good long time, in which case we can kind of lean on that as a, as a boundary. Or is it going to keep advancing? As again, as Splen said, it's going to be advancing in some areas, and it's going to be falling apart in some areas, and we need to sort of feel out which which of those areas is which. Um, does anybody have any final comments or thoughts? I think someone put something in the chat here. I was going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> Dallas has asked about a survey, Howard. A survey. Um, um, yeah, that would be a great idea. I think we should maybe do surveys on a regular basis. It's difficult to get uh, a good feeling for everyone's issues from the conversation. So the sur a survey or something to that effect might be a good way to start the discussion, either next time or the time after that, depending on how quickly we can get things together. I think one of the, the, the really positives to take from this for Harold is that we've actually got this is one of the largest uh, practice groups that we have running at the moment. We've got lots of participation, lots of interest and a, a great ex exchange of ideas. So, you know, let's all keep in touch. Ha Harold's weekly newsletter is really informative. I don't think um, I don't think any of us could spend take the time that you spend, Harold, bringing everything together. So it's really keeping us all engaged and informed. So it's just great news. It's entirely done by GPT. I, I ah! enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been really, really impressed with the amount of uh, skills that we have around the network. Um, I don't know that any, any one of us could handle uh, all of the things that are happening um, just within our own firm. So it's, it's really great to have all of you guys to lean on. And uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next one. And don't forget, we've got the EMEA meeting in Vila um, at the end of September and then the Las Vegas meeting where there's a, the big AI standoff with Harold and Splend and others um, <laughs> at the end of um, October. So if you haven't signed up and you want to come, it's all on the website or you can email me and I can send you the details. <laughs>